Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of my painting tutorial. In this video I'll be finishing off the painting of Ben Moore on the Isle of Mull in Scotland. This is the reference photo that I've been using for the painting and this episode follows on from episode 1 where I talked about the tonal underpainting establishing the main darks and lights of, uh, of the picture. And this was followed by episode 2 where I talked about the main colour block-in stages. And this is where the painting was left off from episode 2. In the next 15 minutes I've tried to capture the essence of doing the definition layer and also the details of the painting, followed by a bit of glazing and finally at the end of the video I'll show you varnishing. So for the definition layer I tend to start working in the background and, and work forward again like I did in the um, colour block-in stage and the colour block-in stage provided a nice ground on which to work on and you can adjust the tones that you established there by putting lighter tones in. On the sunlit side of the mountain I'm using a mixture of French ultramarine and raw umber to try and capture the, the layers of basalt in the rock face. I advise really looking at your reference material to see the structure of the rocks. The lava flows here have a layered appearance, so that's the main cracks defining the horizontal layers, but within each unit there are vertical components as well. Then go into the shadow areas, working in the definition of those zones, using the same mix but um, less white in it. Down the hillside there's more vegetation to deal with, but I still try to establish those that layered appearance in the rocks. Going back to the sunlit area, I start adding um, lighter colours that are a little bit more warmer to try and show where the, the dead grass is, as well as the scree slopes. You will notice I'm using quite a small brush. This is a rigger brush by Rosemary & Co. I tend to use these quite a lot at this stage because it enables quite fine markings. I'm focusing now on trying to represent the dead vegetation on the hillside where the light is hitting it. The contrast between these lighter areas and the corresponding shadow areas that really help to establish the form of the hillside. The hillside is in the distance, I don't want to have too much fine detail so I tend to use my finger just to add a little bit of a blurring effect to that because in the distance you don't see so much detail. As I'm moving forward in the landscape, I'm adding more saturation to the colours. The reason for colours in more background areas to become paler and less saturated is due to the aerial effect or atmospheric perspective, which is the effect of particles in the atmosphere and water vapour that desaturate the colours. I alternate between my yellow ochre grassy colours and the more burnt umber and French ultramarine um, mix for the rocky areas to try and represent these rock layers in that hillside. As some of these basaltic layers are dipping off to the right of the picture, I'm orientating my brush in that aspect to, to make the brush marks easier to, to put down. I continue with this process coming into the foreground down to the water's edge, just trying to add texture to that landscape. Again I use my finger to soften some of those edges that you get with using a, a fine brush because we don't want to see these sharp edges that far in the distance. I turn my attention now to the, the hillside on the opposite side and I actually start with the four, more foreground parts here and that yellow ochre mix again which is trying to show the areas that are capturing the low angle light. Similarly I'm then using darker tones to put in the rock layers so that's burnt umber and French ultramarine again and also sometimes a bit of burnt sienna. This hillside is quite a complex thing to represent in paint actually um, and it's quite easy to get daunted by by such a complicated surface, but I try to break it down into areas of, of shadow, areas of mid-tone, and areas of light, each within their respective groups. So an area of all those ranges for the grassy areas, but also a similar area for the more exposed rock regions. 
an iterative process, marking in areas of light and areas of shade and areas of rock. And I continue to use my finger to blur some of these edges because I don't want things to be too defined. Because remember, in the bigger painting, this area is actually still quite far in the background. I didn't want the painting just to be a, a wall of brown over here. And as we come down on the hillside, I'm introducing a little bit more green into the mix, which again is mixed from French ultramarine and, and cadmium yellow. I'm using an old soft brush just to soften the edges. Drawing a line underneath that stage, I'm just marking in the interface between the, the estuary and the, the hillside, which is actually quite a straight line. And it's important to have, uh, you know, if you're having a straight line, to have it quite straight in this case. Um, I'm then going on to mark on sort of the exposed rocks on the shoreline there. I now focus on the estuary area where the tide is out and there's lots of mud banks and tidal creeks. A large flat brush here and keeping the orientation horizontal because as you go up to the horizon it effectively compresses a lot of your features so things become more linear. This adds more depth and realism to the painting. A lot of these muddy areas are still wet and because they are wet they're reflecting quite a bit of the sky colour so I've added a bit more blue into them and that's particularly true as we come down to this foreground area where the light of the blue sky is really reflecting off those muds. Okay, so I'm adding more French ultramarine compared to burnt umber and clearly a lot more white as well. Sometimes where I make a bit too much of a hard edge I use my finger to, to blur these out. Within these areas, there's still definition and form within the mud banks, so it's not entirely uniform. So I'm using different shades and tones to try and capture that. I continue this process on the left hand bank, adding more bluer shine. And as we come down on the left hand side, where the stream is interfering with the gravel, there are pools of water within the stones. So at this stage, I'm just laying down the appropriate colours. There's a lot of seaweed and debris on these mud banks, so I'm using a finer rigor brush with a more of a raw umber mix to, to mark in some of those darker areas where the seaweed is, is stranded on the mud banks. Moving on to the grassy areas to the left, I'm applying a, a lighter color, which is a, a cadmium yellow and uh, French ultramarine mix with some white um, to mark on the, the lighter areas of the vegetation that are catching the light. I come back later and refine this a bit more. Grass in the foreground will have a bit more of a vertical element to it compared to that in the background because as we're looking uh, more obliquely to it you don't see those features. It's this sort of thing that adds to the illusion of depth in a painting. Here I'm just applying another lighter coat on top. This area I was sort of dreading really, it's quite a complicated area of, of stones and gravel that can be really quite tricky to paint and the key is not to actually draw every stone. So what I'm doing first of all is applying a base layer with a really knackered old brush to try and get an irregular pattern of, of darker tones. Over the top of this, continuing to use the same splayed brush, I use lighter tones to give the illusion of lots of stones. Instead of arranging this uniformly, I try to make a series of banks in the shingle. To help with this illusion, I use a bigger brush to try and mark in some of the bigger stones that are reflecting the light. And as we come into the foreground, these larger stones will become bigger compared to the ones in the background. And towards the top of each of these shingled banks, you increase the density of the stones so they look lighter. And this helps to give the illusion that there's actually a topography on this bank. I add in some raw sienna to the paint mix to try and vary the coloration of the stones, making them slightly more red in places. 
So you can see here my foreground stones are, are larger compared to the ones going off into the background and this helps to give that recession. To enhance this further I'm using a soft fan brush to, to blur out some of these background stones so the detail is less obvious. As I move forward I'm being a bit more sparing with the softening. In the foreground the contrast between the lights and the darks should be greater and for this reason I'm adding a little bit more of a lighter tone to those foreground stones. Now with the foreground seaweed in the colour blocking stage I painted it quite a blue colour and this was the actual submerged seaweed. So I'm going back on top of these adding a darker layer on top which shows that the seaweed is actually coming out of the water. Trying to keep the brushwork fairly erratic in here, trying not to make regular patterns. I've applied some more orange tones using a bit more cadmium red in the, in the seaweed in the foreground and I'm now overlaying that with, with more darks. Now to make water look more realistic I'm adding some ripples just using a lighter sky colour effectively. I wasn't quite happy with the grass on the left so I've gone back again and applied even a lighter tone to, to represent the light catching the, the tops of the grass. And then I've also gone in with a darker tone to try and show this convoluted edge to these, these grassy mud banks. After leaving the painting for a couple of days and coming back for another painting session, I, I thought the, the distant hills didn't have enough contrast to them. Uh, it wasn't really pale enough. Um, so what I've gone and done is come back and added a bit more of a yellow ochre uh, mix with a bit more white in it to try and bring out that sunlit hillside more. I'm continuing this process on the hillside on the left. I'm being careful to try and keep the, the dipping nature of the rocks intact while doing this. Now in, in the more distant upland areas uh, it should be paler so I'm even applying a lighter tone of yellow ochre and white to represent that and I'm blurring it out a bit with my finger. Now it's always important to stand back from your painting and have a look at it from a distance sort of where it will be viewed from when it's finished and I considered that the hill on the left hand side wasn't actually red enough for Applying a glaze here, which is a transparent layer of paint that effectively tints the canvas while retaining the detail of the underlayer, and I'm using a raw sienna, uh, sorry, a burnt sienna glaze, and I use a liquid uh, medium by Winsor and Newton to do that. I also turned my attention to this mud banks. So I didn't think it was quite light enough compared to the foreground because it, it wasn't showing the necessary depth. So I go ahead and lighten some of these mud banks a bit more. I also use a glazing technique for the foreground water because as we're looking more directly into the water you can actually see through it, you're seeing less of the reflection of the sky colour. So I use a, a raw umber uh, glaze here with a bit of um, French ultramarine in, so it's a transparent overlay to darken up some of that water. And I also apply the same technique to the, to the raised areas on the banks on the side. And of course, the last thing to do is sign your name on it. Now, I've let the painting dry for a few weeks and I always varnish my paintings. You can see there that there's differential shine on the painting with some of the darker areas being more matte compared to the glaze areas in particular. And the varnish has the effect of unifying that sheen on it. I tend to use a Winsor & Newton um, varnish and I mix some of the uh, matte version with some of the gloss version, about one third matte, two thirds gloss, because I don't want it that shiny, but I want it to be slightly shiny. And by the way, I'm Rosie. And I'm his daughter. Never work with children and animals. That interlude by my daughter amused me, so I thought I'd keep it in. And here is the final painting. I tend to paint quite small, so actually I scan the paintings in with a flatbed scanner. 
Of course, no painting is complete without a good frame, and I've chosen quite a simple dark frame for this one. Hopefully it doesn't domineer the painting too much. I think it complements it. So that ends the painting tutorial. Thank you very much for watching. Please like my YouTube page. Please subscribe to my Facebook page. And uh, the next episode, I'll be painting something completely different. Thank you.